So today's presentation is essentially just an intro to product design. Uh, a lot of you guys might be especially familiar with UX design or visual design. So I'll be primarily focusing on product thinking and interaction design. Before we get to you guys look on the bottom left corner here, I have a link beacons.ai slash richard.ux. If you scroll all the way to the bottom on this link, you'll see a link to the slides. I don't know how the resolution is on your screen, but there are some diagrams and details that might be a bit blurry. So I would highly recommend you guys open this link on your browser and follow along as we go. I'll give everyone five seconds to do that before. Product design has three core pillars, product thinking, visual design, and interaction design. So I'll go through these one at a time, but I'll focus primarily on interaction design today because I feel like that would provide you guys the most value. So interaction design is essentially how do you get users to do things? And the model that I want to introduce as the focus point around all these concepts is Fogg's behavioral model. So Fogg's behavioral model states that for a behavior or user action that we want to induce, in order for it to occur, three elements must converge at the same exact moment. Motivation, ability, and trigger. Take a look at this diagram over here. You can see the y-axis is motivation going from low to high, and ability goes from hard to easy. And this curve here is called the activation threshold. So when the intersection of motivation and ability exceeds that, a trigger, which is the prompt for an action, will succeed. If it's below it, the trigger fails. Let's do an example. So let's say you're at home and your phone rings, but you don't pick it up because. And I want you to fill in the blanks here. I think of maybe three to four reasons why you wouldn't pick up a phone when it rings. So as you think of reasons why you wouldn't pick up a phone when it rings, enter it in the comments below. Spam callers, great. Spam, no time. Robocalls, won't pick up because you're in another meeting. I know number, don't like phone calls in general. Don't want to talk. You're having lunch, sleeping, bad timing, doing another task, too lazy to reach the phone. Cool. So these are a bunch of really valid reasons. We can actually split these into those three factors we just talked about. The ring or the trigger for the action to pick up a phone could be one of the factors. Your ring could be on, in which case you hear it, and the trigger registers, and then the motivation ability doesn't really matter. But primarily what we can focus on is, let's say, the caller ID. If it's a unknown or a spam number versus maybe your significant other or one of your really good friends, that would probably influence your motivation to pick up the phone. And also your mood as well. If you're in a good mood or in a bad mood, you may be more or less likely to pick up a phone. So caller ID is an example of different variables that would influence your motivation. The phone location, on the other hand, could be an example of ability. So if the phone is already in your hand, it's obviously much easier for you to pick up the phone versus if the phone's in another room. Or maybe the task that you're currently doing could also affect your ability as well. If you're doing nothing and just sitting around and the phone is in your room and it's from someone, the motivation might not be super high, but the ability makes it really easy to do. So you're very likely to pick up the phone versus let's say you're in the shower, you're in the meeting, or you're busy, you're much less likely to do it because does that make sense? For example, if you're waiting for like an interview or something and you're expecting a call from like a company that you really want, your motivation would be really high. And even if you're in a meeting, even if you're on the toilet, you're going to get up and reach for the phone because you're expecting a very important call. So that's an example where the motivation is so high that it overrides the ability. And vice versa, if you're literally really bored, you're waiting for the elevator and you get a, a phone call from maybe an acquaintance, but not a close friend, then the ability is so low that your motivation doesn't need to be high in order for you to do that task. Let's move on to each of these individual components. So let's talk about ability. So in the fog behavior model, he talks about something called the ability chain composed of five components. Uh, the first component is time and money. And this is essentially related to uh, product market fit for your product and how well you understand your users. For example, if you're, if you're a luxury brand, your target audience might have more money but less time versus if you're a mass appeal consumer brand, they might have more time and less money. And those are really big factors on the ability to complete a task. There's also routine, which is related to how well your product fits into their habit or existing behaviors. 
For example, let's say you're trying to get people to try a new toothpaste, right? That's like very easy to do because the model of a toothpaste already fits into most people's daily routines. But if you're trying to introduce, I don't know, some special sort of dental cleaning service that they do like once a month and they don't have to brush your teeth, this example is super weird, but that would be an example of introducing a new habit that might be a bit harder for them. One concept related to that is the hook model, which I won't go into detail here, but I would highly recommend you guys check out. So what I'm going to focus on specifically today is the mental effort and physical effort related to the ability chain. And I'm going to talk about this in the context of interaction cost. So interaction costs can be split into those things I just talked about, physical interaction costs and mental interaction costs. High interaction costs in a product or user experience creates a lot of friction and this increases the ability requirement. If something's very hard to do or very tedious or annoying, the ability for you to do it is much lower. So let's do a very practical UI example here. Look at these two checkout experiences. Which one's easier, left or right? The answer is right because of interaction costs. If we look at this first screen here, there's a lot of mental interaction costs because you're looking at your credit card and you're also looking at the screen and you have to memorize bits and pieces of your credit card number as you input it into the screen. And the second screen here has a lot of physical interaction costs because there's a lot of kind of manual inputs that you need to do to select your payment ship, etc. Whereas the experience on the right with uh, Apple Pay, assuming that you have it set up, is much easier because it's one tap and then you use the face ID to authorize a payment and the interaction cost is very low. There's essentially no mental interaction cost and the physical interaction cost is just one tap. Obviously, if you need to set up Apple Pay for the first time, then it's a bit of a toss up on which one's easier or harder. Let's talk about the two types of interaction costs in a bit more detail. So for mental interaction costs, you can think about it in three big buckets, attention, memory and processing and accessibility. Under attention, I'm going to talk about the concept of progressive disclosure, which is focused on reducing distractions and visual noise, and also uh, introduce the concept of an eye tracking. In memory and processing, I'm going to talk about the concept of a working memory in reference to Miller's Law and also Hicks Law. And then I'll briefly talk about accessibility as well, just to introduce the concept to any designers who don't know it. So let's go through this one at a time. So for attention, the big concept I wanted to talk about is progressive disclosure. So progressive disclosure is essentially the principle of only showing content and information input as it is relevant to their specific task. So for example, this is a very uh, simple example where by default, none of these radio buttons are selected. But as soon as you select one of these radio buttons, the corresponding fields become visible. If they were to show all these fields by default and not use a principle of progressive disclosure, then the field or this user experience would be very long and clunky and there would be a lot of visual noise and distract their attention away from the core elements. So this is one example. Another example of progressive disclosure is actually splitting up a process into multiple steps. So typically you see this with checkout and payment and onboarding. Very rarely will you see a checkout process or onboarding experience in a single step. It's usually broken down into multiple steps because it allows people to focus their attention on just the core uh, subtasks at hand. So how do we actually track and measure how good our experience is at holding attention and directing attention in the right places? We can call an ETS or eye tracking study. Generally, ETSs create something like this, which is a heat map. And you can see by the color, you can see where people are focusing. So this is actually a very common hack for landing pages, where if you use humanoid figures, you always have them look in the direction of the content that you want them to see. So in this landing page, you have a baby looking at the text. Most people will be drawn to see the baby because it's like most visually distinct. And humans have this association with seeing other humanoid shaped objects or things. And then they go through like a standard F-shaped reading pattern for the text. And then generally they go down to the bottom right, which I think this has a CTA. This kind of reading pattern is called the Gutenberg diagram or sometimes called the F-shape reading pattern. The other common reading pattern is Z-shape. If you're doing a very basic layout, you can predict the eye tracking study pattern. But if you're doing more novel or unique layouts, then 
it's always worth it to try and run an ETS to see if people's attentions are drawn all over the place and not on the core elements required for the task. So as I mentioned, with the heat map vision, you can see it break down into a bunch of different reading patterns. These are the most common F shape and F pattern and Z pattern are pretty common. This is like the standard kind of reading behavior for anything that follows a standard layout with images and text. But these are more unique reading patterns are done in maybe certain cultures and certain types of people. The layer geek pattern is where people just read headlines. And this is for really rapid scanning. Spotted pattern is where people are just drawn to images. Marking pattern is if they're identifying something very specific and they already have an idea of what that looks like. Bypassing pattern is essentially just skim reading. Uh, that's even more like than this. And commitment pattern is if you're like really into the content that you're reading or you're typically like more elderly and senior, like my mom and grandparents literally read every single word on every website, which is insane to me, but it exists as a, as a scenario. One kind of interesting effect that we can always leverage in terms of progressive disclosure is the Zygernik effect. The Zygernik effect basically says that humans tend to remember incomplete tasks and they'll have a lot of their attention processing power allocated towards incomplete tasks. Uh, a great example here that I just show, a bit of a dark pattern to be honest, is linked in profile strength. By default, they always give you like a bit of progress even if you barely fill out anything. And then the fact that you have a couple bars like still unfilled will always motivate you to fill them out every time you land on LinkedIn or anytime you think. Of okay, so that's everything I had for attention. If there's no questions, I'm gonna move on to memory and processing. Assuming silence means we're all good. Moving on to this. So the next concept I want to talk about is Miller's Law, which is the concept of human RAM. So Miller's Law basically states that there's this magic number range, 7 plus minus 2, which is the number of items that somebody can hold in their working memory. So your working memory is essentially the temporary storage of memory that you use while doing a task. Although the number 7 plus minus 2 has been like disproven, and it's actually very different depending on the type of person or the type of user, it's still a helpful heuristic to understand that humans can only hold a finite amount of items or information while they're completing a task. So there's two really interesting techniques and examples here to mitigate or improve the human RAM storage aspect if you do need for some reason for them to increase the storage of their working memory. The first technique here is called chunking. So if you look at the string up here, FBI, TWA, CIA, IBM, this is somebody reading this string would view this as six, nine, as 12 distinct items which is on the upper threshold or bound of Miller. Chunking basically breaks down the string into uh, three layer chunks. And instead of conceptualizing this as 12 items, you conceptualize it as four items instead, which is well within the threshold of Miller's law. Uh, so it's much easier to rem remember the string in groups of three rather than each letter at a time. This is also why phone numbers are chunked with three digits and four digits. And also credit card numbers are often chunked in four, four digit numbers. Because this is an example of eliminating the need to store numbers and working memory entirely. Now on iOS, or I think iOS 10, when you have to do a two factor, instead of having to remember this number in its entirety, which is you know, six items, now they have this bar that just pops up on top of the keyboard and lets you input the number from your text message with one click. Another really great example of bypassing Miller's Law is this iOS pattern of comparing models. So previously, if you were to buy a Mac, you would have to view each product detail page in isolation and memorize the specs that you care about and have to store a lot of things in your working memory. So they updated this design in 2012, I believe. And now you can just choose the models that you're debating on in this dropdown. And then you get to view all these specs in a comparison table which eliminates the entire need of storing information in your working memory. I guess the TLDR of what I'm trying to say here is appreciate that humans 
have this concept of working memory. And also, whenever possible, try and think about creative solutions to avoid the dependency on working memory. And if you do need to really stretch it, use the concept of chunking and try and keep the number of items they have to remember. Cool. The next concept here is called Hicks Law. And Hicks Law basically says that the decision-making time has an exponential correlation with the number of options you need to choose from. So a very simple representation of that is this thing here where you have eight options in a row. That's a lot of processing power. It'll take them, let's say, 40 seconds to make a decision. This is easier because now it's constrained to just four options, ideally the four most relevant options. And then the easiest solution would be just showing half the number of options. And the decision-making time for this could be as low as five seconds, for example. So one of the best ways to design with Hicks Law in mind is to actually do uh, recommendations. So this example here is uh, they're making a decision between four plans or technically three plans, and they might spend a lot of time kind of reading through the differences. But they've added this little pattern or heuristic for most popular or best deal or like most suited for you or recommended for you to help people make a better decision. This is actually really smart because of the principle of satisficing. Uh, satisficing basically means that when people make decisions, humans aren't entirely rational creatures who are trying to make the best, most optimal decision at any given point. Most of the time, they're trying to find a solution that's good enough, and they just choose that decision. Uh, so in that case, you'll kind of leverage the principle of satisficing, providing recommendations whenever possible, and limiting the total number of choices is going to significantly reduce the decision-making time and allow them to get through their task a lot faster and ultimately reducing the mental interaction cost. So the next concept here is physical interaction costs. First concept, Fitz Law basically says that the time it takes or the difficulty slash time it takes for somebody to tap on a target, either using their mouse on desktop or using their finger on mobile, is uh, proportional to the distance between their pointer and the target and also the width of the target. So let's say uh, this target here, I'm trying to click on it. If my mouse is right beside it, obviously very easy. If my mouse is in this top right corner, I have to like, move it all the way to the target. And because the distance is longer, the time it takes is a bit longer as well. Difficulty is a bit longer as well. And then if this target was, let's say, really small, like one pixel wide, then it'd be extremely difficult for me to actually find and hit the target regardless of how far my mouse is. So how you should consider this in UI design is... For mobile, you need something called a minimal hit area. So generally, this is 44 by 44 pixels on iOS and 48 by 48 pixels on Android. But generally, 50 by 50 pixels is safe. On desktop, it's about 25 by 25 pixels, but there's no hard and fast rule since the mouse is extremely precise. That does not mean every single element needs to be around 50 by 50 pixels. As you can see here, icons are 24 by 24 pixels, but they typically will have a bit of a internal padding or clearance area. So no other tappable object can be within this kind of bounding box so that when somebody's trying to click on this icon, they're not clicking something else accidentally. So that's why when you design, let's say a row of icons for iOS or Android, you have your icon, which is typically 25 by 24, and you have a 24 by 24 margin or spacing between each icon. If you've ever seen a really badly designed app, you might see a bunch of icons jammed next to each other in a row. And in that case, it becomes really hard for you to actually tap on it because they're so close together. Also on mobile, there's a concept of um, natural reach area. You can see that the screen highlight, depending on if you're left-handed, right-handed, or both, is the easiest for you to access. And then the hard elements are yellow, sorry, stretching elements are yellow, hard elements are red. So what this means is you should place the most commonly interacted elements within the natural hit area. If you remember a long time ago, iOS exclusively used bottom tab bars, which is very well within the natural hit area. And Android used uh, top kind of like hamburger menus, 
which were typically in the hard to reach area. Over the next kind of few iterations of material design, they ended up introducing the bottom tab navigational component because of this reason. Cool, accessibility. I'm not gonna talk too much about this because this is like another four hour concept by itself, but essentially just understand that not every user is an able-bodied individual. And I think it's somewhere as high as like 10% in most places. 10% of your users may have one or multiple impairments, including visual, auditory, motor, speech, and cognitive. If you want to learn more about this, check out something called the WCAG 2.1. It's the Web Accessibility Guidelines, and it has a lot of kind of rules and checklists and templates to account for users who might have accessibility concerns. What, like Aside from the goodness of your heart, you also definitely want to do this because Google gives you a quite a significant boost to the uh, SEO or search engine optimization slash discoverability of your website if you support these alternate use cases. Everything I just said, all of that was related to just the ability aspect of the FOG model. So next we'll talk about motivation, which is a bit more of a ethereal concept. So motivation is split into two types, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation comes from within, it's internal, and typically in, intrinsic motivation is very good for engagement and problem solving. If you want somebody to really be engaged with your product or do some sort of problem solving task, you want them to be intrinsically motivated. And because this type of motivation comes from within, it's very sustainable. Extrinsic motivation is obviously external. So there's some external factor that's motivating them. And it's very good for compliance in terms of getting people to do a basic task like one or a few times. However, it requires a lot of willpower and discipline over time and therefore becomes less sustainable because external motivations definitely lose its effect over time and you need to increase the intensity for the same result. And also they tend to be very costly and just like hard to maintain. So let's talk about extrinsic motivators first. This is essentially the concept of operant conditioning, a really famous scientific experiment done by B.F. Skinner. I'm sure you guys have seen the operant conditioning chamber with the mouse and the electric shock in the, in the, uh, like the food pellet dispenser. But essentially all of it's summed down into the carrot and the stick. So negative reinforcement, AKA the stick is essentially punishments. So in the operant condition chamber, that was an electric shock. And a lot of the times, especially if you're working like a minimum wage job, they typically use negative reinforcement and interest motivation. So the ne negative reinforcement would be getting fired or disciplined or getting fined. Uh, the positive reinforcement, aka the carrot, is reward. And in the same example, the minimum wage job, that would be uh, your paycheck, your money incentive. And in some cases, um, not for minimum wage jobs, but like social status, slash competition mechanics are also related to uh, positive reinforcement. But like I mentioned, these things are really only good for basic compliance and short-term motivation. Like a lot of people will work a job they hate and drag their feet and not really work super hard, but just do the bare minimum because they're only extrinsically motivated. Luckily for us as designers, we have great job prospects and most of us are very intrinsically motivated to create really great products and positive change and improve the lives of users. This is an example of extrinsic motivation in terms of a social status and competition mechanics. So when you're playing a game, a leaderboard is one example of this. If you do really well in the game and you're in the first position, Position, that gives you a bit of an extrinsic motivational boost. If you've used Duolingo before, these are also forms of extrinsic motivation. When you complete a lesson or you hit a streak, you think it's share the shoot with your friends or people see it or you get like a little digital trophy those are all forms of extrinsic motivation another example of extrinsic motivation in terms of negative reinforcement is a uh, loss aversion and some cost let's say buy a digital product for a very large sum of money like 400 dollars a year up front you become very in extrinsically motivated to continue the course like save money or like, avoid wasting money so that's also an example where you might be extrinsically motivated. Intrinsic motivators are a lot harder to grasp and most people haven't really figured it out, but one of the best and most 
prominent theories for intrinsic motivation is self-determination theory, which is essentially the intersection of these three elements, autonomy slash freedom, competence slash mastery, and relatedness slash belonging. So any sort of experience where you have all three elements, you have a chance at creating true intrinsic motivation, which I believe leads to the most sustainable long-term attention and growth. So here are some examples of intrinsic motivation in real products. Duolingo, this is a bit of a mixed bag. I don't think the trophy itself is an, is an extrinsic motivator, but the fact that you complete like all the lessons for a particular language and you become good at it and hopefully you can speak it conversationally, that's a feeling of competence. So it's not a trophy per se, but it's like the feeling that it gains some level of proficiency in a language that makes people want to use Duolingo. This is an example of uh, social mechanics. You can see social mechanics and relatedness. During COVID-19, when a lot of people were quarantined, we saw Clubhouse blow up. It was actually the fastest uh, unicorn that's ever been created in terms of conception to evaluation. And a lot of people got drawn to Clubhouse because it gave people that feeling of relatedness. Like people could choose different interests and get dropped into like different chat rooms and have that human connection. You can also see this example of uh, Nike Run App which is an example of autonomy. So imagine if you had some sort of training app where they gave you a workout program that was really fixed and you had no control over what you did and what your goals were, you'd probably give up really quickly. But because an app like this gives you the ability to edit schedule and plan your own goals up at the beginning, that's an example of giving you the autonomy to control your experience. And that also contributes to intrinsic motivation. So it's actually very hard for a single product to get all three but products I do end up performing very well, like some of the biggest products out there. I think Instagram is a good example of all three, at least early Instagram before all the new changes. Autonomy in the sense that you choose who to follow, you choose your profile. Uh, you can say your profile to be public or private. Competence is this more of a vanity metric thing, but getting more likes and followers. You feel like your content slash life is getting better. That's an example of competence. And then relatedness, the nature of it being like a social media app will obviously connect you with other people and friends. So that's like a rare example where a single product has all three and people became very intrinsically motivated to use our product. Another kind of heuristic or model to conceptualize these motivators is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Basically, it just states that people will tend to prioritize things on the bottom, prioritize uh, these elements bottom up. They won't really move on to the next tier until the bottom or the lower tiers have been fulfilled. So on the bottom, you have physiological and safety. And in today's society, that basically translates to money, wealth. Yeah, money and wealth, essentially. And those are actions of motivate. These things, love, belonging, esteem, accomplish, accomplishment, self-actualization, and achieving one's potential, these are closely related to intrinsic motivators. So just like a really helpful way to think about different types of motivation. Obviously, I've been really pushing the concept of intrinsic motivation in terms of creating successful products. There are some very unique and rare cases where extrinsic motivation makes a lot. Of just a refresher, extrinsic motivation is really good for compliance and one-time tasks. So a lot of uh, finance-based apps, Simple, Wealthfront, Robinhood, they'll try and incentivize you to connect your bank account or sign up with an actual cash reward. And it makes sense for them because the customer acquisition cost is probably far higher than that initial reward they give you. And in the case of Simple, you don't really need people to be intrinsically motivated to use the app. Ideally, you want them to sign up, connect their bank account, and set up auto deposit and then never touch the app again. That's actually the best case scenario because for well simple, you're not tracking metrics like daily active users. You're probably just looking at churn rate and total money, total dollar value managed. So in their scenario, it's actually very smart of them to lean heavily on extrinsic motivation and just get people to do that initial task. Does that make sense? This is more of a abstract example. Most people are intrinsically motivated to learn a language because it's something they want to do. It's, it feels productive. There's a mastery element. There's the autonomy element because you learn at your own pace. And then there's the potential relatedness element because it lets you talk to new people and have a wider access of conversations that you normally wouldn't have. So originally, before they added all this weird gamification stuff, very strong intrinsic motivation. Like most people will pay out of pocket to 
obviously like a language tutor and they don't need any gamification elements to continue it because they are intrinsically motivated. However, there is the effect called the over justification effect where essentially if you are intrinsically motivated and somehow the system starts giving you extrinsic motivation or extrinsic reward, then as soon as those rewards are lost, your intrinsic motivation disappears entirely. So in this case, they've added the concept of streaks and gems, which are very closely tied to extrinsic motivation when they probably didn't need to do it. So this example here is the over justification effects. Essentially, it shifts motivation from intrinsic to extrinsic. The really famous experiment that discovered this effect was essentially they took two groups of elementary school students. The first group, sorry, both groups really like to draw. The first group was brought in once a week to just draw for an hour, and it was just like fun playtime. The second group was brought in once a week as well, but at the end, if they drew a picture, they got a lollipop. And then after a six, the second group, they stopped giving them lollipops, aka the extrinsic reward, and then suddenly they found that the students no longer wanted to draw, so they lost that intrinsic motivation. This is such a weird example because... People became, people by default are intrinsically motivated to learn a new language, but because they added streaks, when they lost a streak, which was their source of extrinsic motivation or their source of extrinsic reward, they essentially just did not want to continue uh, using Duolingo. It's actually very common. If you go on Twitter and just search like Duolingo, you'll see a lot of people complaining. They're like, oh, I was good for a thousand days and I missed one day and I lost my streak and I have no motivation to use it anymore. This is... This actually has a real name. It's called the what the hell effect. Essentially, when you break a personal commitment to yourself, you're like, eh, what the hell? What's the point of doing it? This is very common in people that are on diets. So another really interesting example or experiment was they took two groups of people on a diet. The first group, they're just brought into a room and then they were offered like water. And then afterwards, they were offered cake. The group that had water first refused the cake. The second group, they had a very small like snack, like a candy or like a cookie or something that wasn't like super high calorie. It didn't kill their diet. But once they had that cookie, when they were offered cake, most of them wanted the most of them took the cake as well because you're like, what the hell? I already broke my diet for today. I'm just gonna do whatever. That also manifests in uh, product experiences as well. So that's why, in my opinion, you shouldn't use the street method. It's almost a bit of a dark pattern. All right. So that's everything I have for for interaction design. So let's do a quick refresher. The core of any product is you want people to do things, right? If they use your product, your product will have high retention and you're probably successful. To get people to do things, three things need to happen. You need to have a trigger, you need to have high motivation and high ability. So under ability, we have physical interaction and mental interaction costs, which is attention, memory, processing power, et cetera. And then motivation in terms of intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Obviously, for most cases, you want intrinsic motivation and you want to create the elements of autonomy, content, and relatedness. Those are just some factors, not everything, just some factors for you guys to think about when you're designing an engaging product. I'll answer all the questions at the end, by the way. I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm going to blast through the next. All right. Product thinking is a very deep and complex topic. Most of the time, you'll be working with a product manager. However, I'm going to focus on what I think is the most important concept for every designer to think about. As I mentioned earlier, everything we talked about was to get people to do things with your product. So if people do things and your product is designed in the right way, they should be getting value from your product. So users who get value from your product will end up being retained, meaning they'll continuously use your product over time. And strong retention is hands down the number one indicator of product market fit. And product market fits is the number one thing that any startup investor looks for in terms of predicting how successful a product is. Essentially, if you have a loyal user base, your product is successful. So hopefully you can see how interaction design ties into the concept of retention. So the thing I want to introduce here is us the concept of a flattened retention curve as an indicator for product market fit. So let's take a look at this graph. The y-axis here is retention, usually measured in uh, daily active users and monthly active users, et cetera. So people, how often do people use your product and how many people use your product? 
The Y axis here is time. Regardless of how good your targeting is or how sticky your product is, a portion of your users will always stop using it for whatever reason in the initial segment. What you actually want to look for is you want the retention to eventually plateau. And then the part that plateaued is essentially the portion of your user base that you have product market fit for. So if you look at this orange line, you can see that the retention rate eventually drops completely to zero. This indicates that you have no product market fit. The yellow and plateaus evens out, you have potential product market fit. And ideally, if you're doing things really well, as you're making incremental changes to your product and making improvements and shipping new features, you ideally want to see something called the smile curve. So it drops down a little bit and then it goes back up. And then this is a sign of strong product market fit or increasing product. What you want to do when you're tracking these, when you're tracking retention over time is you want to split out this kind of tracking in cohorts. What that means is you want to segment your user groups by either a time period or by a version. So you can tell that, so you can tell if your retention is going up or down in response to changes you make to your product. For example, if you shift a new feature and you go from version 1.0 to version 1.1, and if version 1.1 has a lower retention curve than version 1.0, you probably want to roll back that uh, that feature or that update because you actually hurt your retention. This is one thing to really focus and pay attention on as a designer, especially because as I mentioned earlier, if you can get people to do things with your product and they're getting value from it, they'll probably going to be retained. If they're retained, you have product market fit. If you have product market fit, your product is likely to be successful and raise money. Sorry, does that make sense? This is a complicated topic, so I'll link a resource to this a little bit later. But yeah, does this make sense? The concept of a flattening retention curve? Okay, cool. And then I'll briefly reiterate the ability chains. The time and money aspect is really just specific to the market that you found. Even though it's called product market fit, in my opinion, it should actually be called market product fit because the market is actually the most important aspect of the success for your product. You need to choose like a very specific user group that you feel like you can provide a 10x better solution for. Ideally, you want it to be a painkiller solution. So solving a really critical need rather than a vitamin solution, which is like a nice to have. There's a lot of articles and resources that I'll link afterwards on how to choose the best market. But the main thing I want to talk about is market is the most important and you want to look at all your potential users through the lens of time and money because it's closely tied to the ability chain. There's also the concept of red ocean and blue ocean. Essentially, this talks about the competitiveness of a market. So red ocean obviously means there's a lot of competitors. Blue ocean means that there's no competitors and you're creating a brand new market. There's two types of markets. In addition to red ocean and blue ocean, there is monopolistic and fragmented. So monopolistic basically means that there's one big player that kind of dominates the entire market. For example, like Uber and Lyft are monopolistic for a ride share. And then blue ocean is, oh, sorry. And a fragmented market is an example where there's a lot of different types of, a lot of different players are all like small to medium size. An example of this would be grocery stores or fast food chains or convenience stores. There's a lot of different options for consumers to choose from. In general, it's very easy for you to enter a, a fragmented market, but the potential for expansion is quite small. Ideally, you want to find a blue ocean. And how you can do that is if you find a big, valuable piece of a monopolistic market that hasn't been served super well. So for example, in the entire transportation industry in general, rideshare is a big piece of it nowadays, but there's actually this new kind of blue ocean market for uh, scooter rentals and e-bike rentals that's not quite big enough for any of the monopolistic players to really focus on, but it's big enough for a new startup to own. And that's an example of kind of creating a blue ocean within a red ocean. Again, not enough time to go into this in too much detail, but yeah, just look up the concept red ocean and blue ocean for more details. Okay, so I'm not gonna go visual design in too much detail. I'm gonna save some time for questions. I'll just blast through these slides really quickly and you guys can look at it on your own. TLDR of why visual design is important. Honestly, I think visual design is the least important out of those three pillars. 
But there is one thing we can't ignore. That's the aesthetic usability effect. Users typically perceive aesthetically pleasing designs as designs that's more usable. They're more forgiving and tolerant of minor usability issues, and it impacts their first impressions and the willingness to try a new product. This is an example. Honestly, I think Apple has horrible design, but most people don't because of literally this effect. Like this Apple mouse, you can see here in this really nice mock-up, very sleek looking, but it has horrible usability. Like you can't charge your mouse and use it at the same time. Like they literally could just put the port right here and have it function like a normal wire. But they have this really big gaping usability flaw. Despite this, most non-designers still think this mouse is really well designed. When you're designing, make sure you have consistency, reference a law of similarity as part of the Gestalt model. Elements that look the same should work the same. Contrast, make sure you have enough contrast. Please reference contrast ratios in terms of legibility of text and background. You want to make sure that you have very clear visual regions in your UI so users know what parts of the experience is meant to be perceived as one group and which ones aren't related. And also, obviously, for text and typography, you want it to be a legend. Check out contrast-ratio.com to check contrast ratio for all your text. If you design in Figma or any modern design tool like Webflow, they have built-in contrast ratio trackers. Also, they have a bunch of plugins for this stuff. Generally, according to WCAG, you want if you want like triple A or double A compliance, you want contrast ratios of about like between three and four. So white on black obviously is the highest contrast ratio, so it's be green. And then gray on white is obviously way too low. You have a contrast ratio of 1.35, which won't pass. I won't talk about relative spacing or white space. Maybe I'll just do a summary here. When designing, something to keep in mind is uh, consistency. Like I mentioned on this Apple website, all buttons that they can click on are blue. So you establish the interaction model that anything blue can be clicked on. Uh, white space gives every element enough room to breathe. You want to avoid like visual noise. Uh, similarity here, you can see that the typography styles for the name, the product, the price, and the specs are all distinct, whereas all these specs are the same typography. So uh, this creates a mental association and content hierarchy that anything that's this size in gray is a technical spec. There's also the principle of alignment. I think this is pretty self-explanatory. And there's also the principle of proximity. And what this means is if you look at the spacing between, or actually if you look at this and squint your eyes from a few feet away, you'll perceive this as columns. And the reasons we do that we do this is because the space between columns, um, sorry, the space between rows is sh smaller than the space between columns. So because the space between columns is wider, we see these things in columns and it becomes like visually for us. Colors, general design tip. One of the safest ways to design a clashing UI is to actually design everything in grayscale and then only add your primary color to interactable elements. So the logo, the button, and the navigation. And then this is a UI, so it has to have that. But that's like a very safe and easy way to have good color balance in your UI. If you want to get more advanced, there's something called a 60-30-10 rule. We have a 60%, 30%, 10% split between primary, secondary, and accents. Cool, sorry, I rushed through the ending there, but I think most of the visual stuff should be pretty self-explanatory, but thank you guys for listening to me talk for an hour. I hope this was useful. Um, yeah, more resources here. If you go to beacons.ai, everything's linked. I do have a Facebook mentorship group where I'll do like group sessions once in a while. They can join. I have a newsletter that you can subscribe to. I try and publish once a week. It has a lot of technical articles on design career, growth, product, and more technical interaction design stuff. I have a medium blog as well and Instagram that isn't super active now, but there's a lot, like there's 500 plus carousel tips of things for like visual design and interaction. And then if you guys want to connect with me on LinkedIn, here's my LinkedIn. And then I do paid mentoring consulting. So if you want to book time with me, you can also use this link here.